It was Tuesday morning. It was time for my weekly one-on-one -on -one with Alex, an engineer on my team. Sat there in the meeting room, had my coffee ready. Alex walks in. And I could tell immediately they were not happy. Alex was representing our team as part of a big company-wide engineering initiative. We were making uh, some big changes to our developer tooling. And our team, for some historical reasons, had some unique architectural choices. So we had some unique requirements. Alex was fuming. I spoke with Pat on Thursday, and we agreed that their team would support our VMs. But then we get into the meeting with the VP this morning, and Pat had completely gone back on what we'd agreed. The infrastructure team, they're moving ahead without supporting us. I don't know what happened. I've called this talk, Being Right is Only Half the Battle, because as engineers, we spend a lot of our time dealing with computers. And computers are binary, they're Boolean, it's zeros and ones, it's true and false. The source of truth of what the computer is trying to do at any given moment is the code that you can dig into. But the other part of our job, in fact, probably the most important part of our job as we level up in our careers, is dealing with people. And people are messy. People are opinionated. People are forgetful. They're biased, they're hypocritical, they're stubborn, and that's just me. <laughs> I'm just one person. When you have to deal with a whole group of people, it's, it's like the, the great philosopher Tommy Lee Jones once famously said, <laughs> a person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. So I'm really stoked to be here. I'm way really stoked to be at this conference. I think it is so great that a conference exists that is not just for engineering managers and not just about technology, but it's for all the people working, doing technical leadership. Could we actually just do a quick show of hands? Like, actually, everyone, everyone put your hand up. We'll start off with this way. Everyone put up your hand. If you are currently a manager, if you currently have people that report into you, drop your hand. All right, so majority, good number. And if you're still with your hand up, if you maybe think someday you want to become a manager, drop your hand. So then the people, those of you here who want to stay technical, perfect, drop your hands. That's good to know because, yes, the secret to your career growth is being able to have increasing impact over larger groups of people over time. And fun fact, just getting a title like engineering manager or staff engineer doesn't give you that influence. <laughs> so this afternoon, I'm going to talk about how to scale yourself up, how to grow your ability to set direction. And in fact, I'm going to teach you three superpowers this afternoon. But first, who am I? Uh, my name's Rod. Um, I've been managing engineering teams for almost 10 years now. Um, previously worked at companies like Slide, Bose, Google briefly. And for the past few years, I've been leading engineering teams at Dropbox. I primarily work with the teams building Paper, which is Dropbox's real-time collaborative tool. Um, quick plug it is the best way to get your ideas done quickly, share them with other people, get feedback, build up consensus and direction. And um, you can do things like including code and images and edit in real time and embed images and audio and things like that. And most importantly of all, you can give team fist bumps in the comments, which is just an objectively awesome thing to do. <laughs> All right, so three superpowers, as I said. So by the end of this talk, you will know how to read minds, how to control reality, and how to predict the future. Oh, yeah, you get your money's worth this time. All right. Now, before I start, an important disclaimer. For the purposes of this talk, I assume that you actually are right, OK? Now, I, I don't know. Maybe your team should be switching from a monolith to a service-oriented architecture. Maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe Git, Mercurial, I don't know what's right for you, you know. I don't know if you should be pivoting to blockchain. Uh, actually, I do know that. Don't do that. It's a terrible idea. Um, anyway, please use these powers for good. So, to begin with, how to read minds. So, 
I'm going to teach you an ancient technique, one that has been found by researchers and scientists all over the world to be highly effective in seeing into the mind of someone. Ask them questions. <laughs> okay, may have oversold this. Um, but this may seem like an obvious statement, but you can only truly influence people if you understand what they already believe. Asking people, asking people questions drives you to understanding, not just you understanding them, but also as you ask the questions, listen to their responses and respond to them, it helps you find the real issues and helps them understand you and your viewpoint. So, suppose I'm trying to convince my boss, Joe, that our team is, we've got too many bugs. Our bug backlog is too big. We need to spend some time fixing those, and we need to you know, invest in that. We've got so many customer complaints. We should slow down on shipping new features while we fix the bug backlog. And Joe says to me, well, I don't know if this is the right time. It's not really our top priority. Now, my natural instinct would be to try and convince Joe. Well, yes, but you know, like, look at the bug count. Look at how long these bugs have been open. Look at all these feedback emails. But imagine if I paused there, and instead of trying to convince, ask some questions. What are our top priorities? It's not our top priority right now. It's not the right time. What are our top priorities? Maybe Joe's concern is that we're not growing our user base fast enough, and it doesn't matter um, how many bugs we fix or how good the experience is for our existing users if we can't get people in the door. If I hear that, maybe I can change my pitch a little. Well, you know, word of mouth is very important, and if our existing customers are having bad experiences, that, that probably spreads. I can adapt. Or equally, you know, now is not the right time. Well, when is the right time? Ask that question. Find out their perspective. And so what are the kinds of questions that are good to ask? Well, one particularly good one to start with is a playback question. This is the clarifying, repeating something back and asking for confirmation. So what I, what I heard from you is we're going to wait until we've improved the app's startup time performance, and then we're going to fix the bugs. Did I, did I get that right? Because it's clean, it's simple, it gives you that opportunity to make sure that you're on the same page. And another thing to watch out for, blur words. Really important to clarify these. I tell you, OK, we need that spec. We need you to write that by the end of the day on Wednesday. Clear instruction. When is end of day on Wednesday? <laughs> like, to me, maybe it's because I want that interview on Wednesday, so I have time to read it on Wednesday evening, and then I've got a meeting on Thursday morning where I'm going to go and talk about that. But you hearing that here, well, interview Wednesday, as long as I'm done by 23 or 11.59 p.m. Wednesday night, or, well, actually, at that point, it might as well be Thursday morning. You could deliver what you think you've agreed to, and yet our expectations are dashed. So look for the blur words. And the question you ask is, what does blank mean to you? What does end of day mean to you? Lots of those of you think, like, I, I, we need it as soon as possible, ASAP. That's a classic one. OK, we need it ASAP. Well, does that mean you know, today, in the next hour, next week? You don't really care, but you're just trying to put pressure on me to deliver something? Ask the question. Actually, I, I gave myself a challenge last night. I tried to come up with the most clear sounding but meaningless request that I could give someone. <sighs> yeah, well, we need to improve performance of most of the pages ASAP. <laughs> improve performance, most pages ASAP. What does that mean? Like, so narrow it down. Ask the question. Do I actually have something in my mind when I say that? Or am I just winging it? But let's talk about it and narrow it down. Then you get something like, well, by June 30th, we need to get the P95 server response time below 200 milliseconds for all pages accessed by more than 100,000 hits per day. You can actually get an attainable goal that you're both aligned on. Another good way to ask a question, especially when you're trying to influence something that's like a big, important decision. You've been swayed by the awesome talks this morning about uh, how you should be thinking about performance monitoring and uh, observability and stopping pages, and you want to get that, your team to do that. Well, 
The problem is, if you just walk in tomorrow and say, we should change everything, people will go, well, no, that's expensive and crazy and confusing, and how would we even do that? So, try asking, on a scale of 1 to 10, how happy are you with the current state of our pager responses, our pager load? And if someone tells you that, they're like, oh, it's a 4. Well, OK, how do I get from a 4 to a 5? Don't try and do the perfect 10. Don't shoot for that. Because it'll take a long time to do, and the chance of success is low, and um, the, you know, people will doubt the benefit they got when you finally get there. So start with the incremental thing. Well, how about if we can stop the number of pages that happen after 8 p.m.? We're going to, if we can solve that, if we can work out how to stop that happening so people aren't woken up in their sleep, that's what we'll fix. And then over time, you start to show that you're able to drive that, you're able to get that next step. And well, now the next problem is we don't have enough people in the rotation or we have too many, you know, you can find that next step and drive towards it. So there's one other real big benefit of asking questions. And that is people love talking about what they think. I mean, look at me. I have spent a lot of time on this talk, flown across the country just so I can talk uninterrupted for 30 minutes. <laughs> So, if you ask good questions to the people you're working with, and not just like small talk, how was your weekend, that kind of thing, but you actually ask good questions and listen to their answers and respond to them, you start to build up rapport. You start to build up trust. You start to build up the social capital that you can then use to drive these things forward. And then you have an ally in your discussions, in your future discussions, as you're trying to drive something forward. Now, a bit of a warning. Sometimes you will ask questions of people and you'll find out things that maybe you did not particularly want to know. But it's worth the risk and again, it's still useful information. So there we go. You know how to read minds. Check. I have another superpower to teach you. How do you implant truth in someone? How do you warp reality? How do you control the world? You know, you want to be like this big purple chap. Um, Theranos, I think that's his name. Um, <laughs> it, actually, incidentally, after seeing Endgame at the weekend, I did consider rewriting this entire talk to be a metaphor where Theranos was a developer going on their own and the Avengers was a team that worked well together. Um, but I figured it wasn't fair to you, any of you who haven't seen the movie yet. Didn't want to spoil the fact that Hawkeye thinks that you should use spaces instead of tabs. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry. And aside, you want to change perception. You want people to bend to your will. You want to set a strategy. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, I know, I'm sorry. You're, you're all sat there and you're like, no, I don't want to set a strategy. I just want to engineer. I just want to build things. Strategies are those things that like, the business people do. And they announce them at all hands using presentations with like, light bulbs and chess pieces. and. Oh, then like three months later, everyone's forgotten about it until the new strategy comes along. And, you know, maybe that's just my experience. Um, but when it's done well and when it's done at the right level, strategies, strategies are your best friend for driving change. And they're not just for managers. They're a tool for the individual contributors because I, it's, I'm going to teach you the simplest, cheapest, easiest way you can define strategy. And it's this phrase, even over. The even over statement. It's a way of defining the success of a plan or a project or, or a company. And what you do is you select two good things. Two things that objectively anyone would want. But you say, we will value this one even over this one. So like the business strategy standpoint, where this kind of came about was like when Amazon went public and Jeff Bezos wrote this like day one memo. Um, and he wrote the section that was called something like, it's all about the long term. And basically pitched that, you know, Amazon was going to uh, make decisions and weigh trade-offs differently than some com companies. We'll make investment decisions in light of long-term market leadership considerations rather than short-term profitability. You know, essentially, we're going to focus on long-term growth even over returning profits to shareholders. Both those things are good. I, if I can get a company that can do both, great. But by stating that clearly, not only did he lay out the success metric by which Wall Street and the industry should be thinking on grading them on, but also 
empowered all of Amazon's employees with how they should consider things, how they should make these trade-offs. So to kind of like give you an example of how that kind of an even overstatement might work for you, let's go for a very generic case. Think about the last time you were looking for a place to live. You probably decided some trade-offs you were or will, weren't willing to make. You know, I'll take access to convenient public transport even over having an in-unit laundry. Or I'll take a place with enough bedrooms so we can start a family, even over having an amazing coffee shop within walking distance. Or I'll take paying a sane amount of rent even over living in San Francisco or New York. <laughs> the key to something being a strategy, though, is to write it down and share it. Because if you think that having a hot tub is more important than having car parking spaces and the people you're moving in with don't, you're only going to discover that conflict late on in the process, when you're trying to think about signing leases or applying for mortgages, when it hurts. So in your jobs, in your roles as technical leaders, whether managers, whether ICs, what might it look like on your team? Well, again, the classic one I kind of talked about before. We are going to value fixing old bugs even over shipping new features. The chances are, on your team just now, there's an implicit belief one way or the other around this. People think that their job is one or the other of these and one's more important. But if people aren't agreeing on that, if that's not aligned, it's going to get tricky. Another good one, like this is when I was managing a, a product growth team. And I made it clear that our strategy was going to be fast iteration on experiments, even over shipping polished UIs. I actually told my team, if I don't have like people coming to me pissed off about how shoddy our UIs are, we're not pushing hard enough, we're not moving fast enough. The head of the time wasn't terribly happy about that, but it gave my team the guidance on how to think about these things and empowered them to make those decisions without having to worry about running it up the tree and hearing how people felt. So the advantage of being explicit with a strategy is that once you build alignment, people make the decisions you want them to make without you having to actually be there. You don't have to micromanage. You don't have to be in the meetings. You don't have to be interrupted with people asking you questions. Double win. So you can set strategy, you can control reality. That's the present. How do you know what's going to happen in the future? Well, you get the Predictatron 3000. And no, it's, I'm sorry. It's going to be, all right, another business strategy thing. So the big meeting's coming up, the one where you and your team have 30 minutes to convince the stakeholders of your big idea, the big game-changing thing that's going to just like, you know, set the, the era to come for your, yeah, for your group. How do you know what's going to happen in that meeting? You talk to people beforehand. You socialize. One of the most important things you can do when you have an idea is to socialize it and get feedback on it at the early stage. Start people thinking the way you're thinking and hear their concerns. Don't wait till it's perfect. Don't be like, I have to get the perfect you know, presentation and slide doc, and I only have half an hour with this VP, and it has to, that's the moment that counts. Like, I like to preface early discussions about things with people as like, ah, here's a half-baked thought. I'm just you know, muddling around with this just now. It's like the conversational equivalent of sketching something on a whiteboard as compared to you know, your 20 page, you know, slide deck that's beautifully arranged. And ask questions. How would you react if I said we should dot, 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 dot? What would worry you if we decided to listen to those concerns and objections and use those to hone your strategy and your communication as you start to talk to more people? And that's important too. You need to build up the audience gradually. Start with the one-on-ones. Get your trusted friend. Get your, you know, the person you can just bounce stuff off of and you feel comfortable with. Find out what they think. But don't limit yourself to those people. Go and find the scariest, meanest, grumpiest engineer on your team 
and find out what they think. Because not only are they likely to give you good, useful feedback, but then later on, the next person you can talk to, you can be, well, me and Taylor were just chatting, and what I'm thinking is, and suddenly you have some backing for your idea. And don't just limit yourself to your peers. Go up, go down, go sideways. You know, Try and get some one-on-one -on -one time with the stakeholders, whoever this VP is that's going to be making the end decision. Try and get some time with them, and they're probably not as busy as you fear. Gather their perspectives, gather their objections before it's actually time to sell and make the decision. And if you're a TL or the EM for a team, talk to the people on the team who will actually be implementing this. Make sure you're getting their perspective, their feedback. Again, not only are you getting good feedback, but you're helping them feel part of the discussion, part of the decision. They feel some ownership of this idea. This was not you came down from on high and said, go do this thing. No, we worked together and came up with a plan. Who doesn't want to be in that position? The fun thing is, often I found that your idea can just become the truth before you've even got to that final meeting. You share something broadly, and then suddenly just people are talking about it as if it's a thing. Especially, like, give your, if it's a project, give it a code name. Just be like, oh, this, this is Project Potato. And uh, yeah, suddenly you have people in the meeting talking about, have you heard about the new potato strategy? It's, it's <laughs> naming things gives it power. In fact, I've actually found myself sometimes where I've had something like, oh, there's a problem with like, on-call rotations and how people are spending their time, and oh, I'm going to be making this request, and I don't know how people are going to push back on it. It's going to be controversial. But then by the time I've talked to people, I've run it by the engineers who would actually be on the rotation. I've run it by other managers. I've talked to one of the PMs. And then suddenly I send out the email that I'm like, worried it's going to be controversial. And like within five, 10 minutes, three emails back, going, this is great. Thanks so much for doing this. Oh, this is going to really help. Because I've worked out like what are people's objectives, objections, and then just in my email, I'm like, hey, I know we're worried. This will do, 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 do. I can just put that in there. And people go, yeah, that was my worry. Oh, we've thought of that. Carry on. And actually, that's an important part. Write things down. This is, uh, you know, the, uh, Dave's talk earlier about like, writing architectural uh, designs and putting them somewhere people can find them. Do that for everything. Um, maybe use an excellent collaborative real-time editing tool that has, uh, allows you to easily add comments, add mention people. Did I mention the fist bumps that you can do to people? Oh, yeah. Um, Dropbox.com slash paper. It's free if you have a Dropbox account. Um, but seriously, document, document the decisions made, why they were made, and share them as broadly as possible. And that way, your future self can find them. You know, email or Slack is better than nothing. Send it out to the group. Send it out to the team channel. There's a chance someone will find this again. You know, just write it down. If you had a meeting, you agreed something. It wasn't even a meeting. It was just a couple of people chatting in the team area. And then just go, type it down. Hey, TC, this is what I think we agreed to. Um, did I capture it correctly? Because people forget. It's not their fault. They're not being malicious or incompetent. But in a month's time, they're not even going to remember you had the conversation, never mind what you agreed to during it. Now, sometimes people look at the things I'm discussing here and worry that it's kind of manipulative, that, you know, isn't this just politics? And that's actually, that's one of my triggery buzzwords. Politics is oh, so political, is a massive blur word for me. When I hear, oh, I don't like dealing with that team, it's, oh, it's, all the, it's so political. What I hear is, oh, that team made a decision that I don't agree with, and I don't know why. So if you find yourself in that position, like someone on your team saying that, you're even thinking it yourself. Ask the questions. Find out the why. Get the understanding. Maybe they have excellent reasons you don't understand, or maybe they are making a mistake, and you can help them get there. And no, this isn't manipulative. This is doing your job. The reason we are paid the money we are paid is not because we are good at turning ideas and thoughts into lines of Go or Python or JavaScript. It's because we are smart people that uh, make difficult decisions frequently in creative ways. And having influence over more than just the code or your immediate team, that's how you add more and more value to your business. This is how you scale impact. And one last tip, if you do have that decision-making meeting, Get your team in a huddle beforehand. Just, okay, the meeting's at 10.30, we're gonna meet at 
Get the people in a room and just agree, this is what we're going to say, this is how it's going to go, this is what we're going to talk about. Because there is nothing worse than walking into that room and everyone falling to disarray in front of the stakeholder. It's not good for you, for you achieving your goal. It's not great for the stakeholder who's like, I have a lot of other things to be doing and they don't even know what they want. So get that time, make sure you know what's going to happen in that room. Predict the future before you walk in there. That way you're more likely to achieve your goal without that discomfort of sitting in the room. So those are my tips. Ask questions so that you know what everyone's thinking. Ask the playback statements to clarify. Make sure the blur words aren't there and everything is crystal clear. And listen. Don't just nod, smile, and check your email. Listen. And then set strategy so that other people are making the decisions the way you want them to make them without having to bug you. And take your ideas, socialize them, huddle with folks, get the, build that rapport and trust you got by asking the questions so that you know that people are thinking the same way you are so you can drive your uh, project to success. And by doing all of that, you'll find that being right becomes a whole lot easier. Thank you very much.